Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth. With your host, Angelo Ponzi. I am Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Have you ever sat on a board for a business, a nonprofit, or an association? Well, I have. What about being an advisor to a company? Yep, I've done that too. But what I find many times that those roles just don't have a lot of things in common. In my past experiences, many are run very differently. Sometimes the board is very hands-on, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you show up once a quarter and you listen, you give some advice, you eat lunch and wave goodbye. See you next quarter. I don't like those kinds of boards. I like to be involved. I like to understand what's going on. And I think that's really important as you're working on being an active participant and being able to offer solid advice. After all, that's why they're bringing you in for your expertise and your talent to make sure you can help them move forward. So when does a company decide to bring on a board? And more importantly, where do they find these folks? Well, I'm going to let you know. My guest today is Martin Rosansky, CEO and founder of Boardseye, which is an opportunity network for executives seeking to find a board position. Now, don't go away. I'll be right back. And I'm sure, no, no pun intended, you will not be bored with this conversation. A chief marketing officer has both the power and the responsibility to drive long-term strategic growth that can ultimately lead to organizational prosperity. And that growth starts with a vision. What is your firm's definition of success? Growth? How will you strategically work towards expansion, for example? Equally important, what is your customer's perception of your firm? And how well do you meet a need or deliver value? When you begin to align your vision with that of your customer, you build a stronger, lasting relationship with them. You see the whole picture, realizing the lifetime value of that customer as well as the lifetime value you provide. A CMO must look at success with a strategic mindset, looking beyond the transactional. The CMO must understand the customer journey, utilizing the competitive intelligence, embracing and leveraging your unique market insights. If your business is ready for growth and you need a CMO, but you're not quite ready for a full-time person yet, I'd welcome the opportunity to explore the benefits of using a fractional CMO. Visit theponzigroup.com to learn more. As I mentioned, I have Martin Rowinski, CEO and founder of Boardseye, which is an opportunity network for executives seeking to find people like me to sit on their boards and for people like me to find a board to sit on. So I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Angela, and thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm excited uh, to have you here. And, and now this is uh, new to me. Boardseye is is I'm not going to call it a new organization it's because it's been a few years and we're going to, I'm going to get you to talk about that. But I, I'm going to be open and honest with my audience that I actually have now become a member of it. So I'm I'm excited to hear more details about it. it I, I just got my credentials today. I went awesome. in. Uh, I'm a hunting and pecker kind of guy, so I don't read instructions. <laughs> so it was fairly easy. I actually did apply uh, twice today. Uh, I awesome. think I see some areas I need to to clean up on my profile, but other than that, it was it was pretty easy. So why I'm talking about board team, my audience right now is going, what the heck is he talking about? So why don't we take a few minutes and why don't you explain <laughs> what the company is? Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, you you uh, you joined, you got your credentials to what we call the um, executive matchmaking process. Um, Boardsy specializes, um, some people call it Boardsy, by the way, some people call it Boards I, I even had a person the other say Board SI, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, we uh, um, definitely came up with a name in hopes to be catchy and uh, related to exactly what we do, which is board matching. So, um, Boards I basically matches up, uh, executives with, uh, either board of advisors um, or a board of executives positions. Uh, we work with public companies, mid-range companies, uh, startups. Uh, startups range from they've had a seed, they've had a pre-seed, and they've had no seeds or are bootstrapped. Um, as a matter of fact, I think three new positions that went up today 
uh, fit almost all three of them. Uh, we had a public company that we just listed a few days ago. I think it was last week. Uh, we have a company we listed today that's uh, looking to go public. They're, um, they're doing that, I think, by October, if I remember right. And they're looking to add members to their board prior to going public. So that's actually a great opportunity because you will be, uh, the executives will be receiving some stock. So, um, and uh, there are companies that are looking for funding. So obviously they're looking for members that either, you know, can help them with funding or can help them with connecting them with uh, whether it's VC or seed money. So it, the, the opportunities range all over the place, but that is the, the basis of uh, Boards Eye. Uh, you joined and you got credentials. Um, what you joined and the platform that you have saw, like you said, it's very simple. Uh, it is a slightly upgraded version from uh, what it was originally. Uh, and uh, we are actually working, we're about 70% there uh, on a another update to our platform, which actually is going to include a lot more tools, uh, some internal communication. You were speaking about your profile needing cleanup. Uh, that's actually going to be one of the things you will be able to do on the new platform yourself. Um, you will also have the opportunity to make your profile public or not. Right now, the profile is not public. It's internal only. Um, so basically, you will have an opportunity to make that public in the future. Um, what are some of the other great things we're working on um, well, some of the features I actually can't talk about right now. Sure, but sure. Yeah, there, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of things. We don't want to give any secrets away. But you know, <laughs> it, it, one of the things I noticed on the site because you're talking about its advisors and a lot of startups, but I actually saw positions like for CEO and presidents, um, COO. So I mean, they were. It looked like it was a, almost a recruiting platform to to some degree. We we have taken on when companies came to us and asked for that. We have put a few of those positions up but we if you look at all the newest ones that have been up in the last you know six months um maybe a little shorter than that it, we're trying to focus on um on board positions only that was our original focus we got distracted with companies hoping to find executives but for the most part the people that sign up with us the executives they're not looking for a full-time position you know, I mean, sometimes I, I'm not going to predict people's future. They might be open to it, but uh, that that's not our angle. Our angle is not to take somebody away from what they're doing and put them in a different position. That's a headhunter. Um, so we're, we're trying to focus on uh, board pos as many board positions as we can. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Like, otherwise, you start to dilute what the brand is and you be just become a recruiting site, right? Now, Exactly. So what, what was the impetus for you to start this? And I believe the date was back in 2017. Did I get that right? Yeah. So I what, think, yeah, yeah. wake up one day and said, hey, I think I'm going to start a uh, software <laughs> platform for, you know, swipe left, swipe right for your executive. <laughs> hey, that's a great idea. Uh, I, might, I might steal that. Just kidding. Uh, no, no uh, problem. TM, <laughs> TM. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it definitely, you know, to be honest with you, for me, uh, the concept has been in work for a long time. In 2017, we did start and it was, uh, it was a rough start. Um, you know, the, the question always is, where do you start? Where, what do you start building first? Um, and obviously, we, we started with both. Um, and started small and, and been growing and things are growing even faster now than, than last year. Um, so name recognition is definitely helping us out right now. Uh, that's what's attracting some of the public companies that are coming to us. So uh, we're doing a little bit less chasing of the companies and we're actually receiving some great feedback and companies are coming to us, which is for, for me, that's you know a dream come true. But how it came about, um, selfishly, actually, um, I happen to have some great partners that we worked with in the past, started other tech companies in the past. Um, I was uh, just finishing up a consulting gig that I was doing, and I've always wanted to help out startups. And my, my concept of helping a company as an advisor um, was at a startup level. Uh, I, I 
personally feed off of that energy. Um, I think it keeps me young, uh, keeps me creative. Um, so I actually looked around and tried to see how I can connect with some startups and they didn't really find anything out there that was exactly what I was looking for and had a really hard time finding it. So talk to my partners and uh, they kind of had the same ideas and uh, we decided to to start up Boardsai. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's really, it a, about. it's a technology company. I mean, it's it Correct. has a focus and a purpose, but at the end of the day, it's a it's a SaaS platform. It's a software technology. Yes. So as you're growing the business, what what keeps you up at night? Uh, well, what used to keep me up at night is um, not much keeps me up at night now. Um, <laughs> things have settled down a little bit and are a little bit more organized. But uh, I mean, you know, in the beginning, it was very very intense. Uh, you know, how do you convince a company that you can bring on an executive for them? Uh, nobody's heard of Boardsai. Who is Boardsai? Um, how do we find the executives? And, and, that, and that was a tough part of, of a start, right? One, you got to bring on the executive. And two, you got to find a company to, to bring on as well. And then you got to make the match happen. So uh, that really was what kept us up at night, um, kept me up at night. Um, once we figured out how to find the executives, which actually out of those, out of the two, uh, stress levels, that was probably the easier part. Um, the part of convincing companies that we're here to help them to, to grow, um, that was the, the, probably the harder part. And I know there's been other companies that have attempted to do what we do and that's usually was their failing point. Um, and we did a lot of AB and CD <laughs> uh, testing and, Run Z now. and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're test, we, we tested it out. And, uh, but yeah, we, we finally figured out how to attract, um, and how to do our PR work as well. Um, and it's, uh, it's been working it, uh, you know, and, and sometimes it's, it's just a matter of time, you know, we, we've been beat up and, and, you know, you hear people all the time. I mean, this is in any business, right? Uh, this isn't going to work. That's going to fail. Or, you know, I'm not sure if your model is the right model. Uh, as a headhunter company or recruitment company, we're, we're definitely uh, have a different structure than, than most headhunters. So it's a little disruptive to, to the industry. But, um, but we stayed on course, didn't change. The things that we did change was how we bring companies on and how we find them. And, um, and then once we figured out the, the special formula, how to do the custom matching, how to do the custom searching for our executives, uh, and, and it's working now, it's just a matter of, uh, of time. So, um, yeah. Well, it's a lot about marketing. I mean, I'm, the, I'm a marketer. I'm a fractional CMO. Yeah. And, and, and so to me, it's about building awareness. I mean, there's all that back end, which has yep. to work. But at the end of the day, you still have to bring people, whether it's companies or people like myself. And so for me, you know, I've seen it uh, pop up on my job boards, you know, with some kind of marketing trigger that got into my feed. And, and so I was interested. I actually um, clicked on one maybe a few months ago. Okay. And I got a call and, you know, your young lady, one of your screeners called me, we talked and, and I, you know, it was the, I don't know, maybe in November, it was like a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to, you know, I'll deal with it next year. And then it <laughs> happened again and it happened again. And I kept seeing things that were of interest to me, you know, sitting on a board, I, I sit on a board already, but I, I wanted to do a little bit more of that this year as part of my business strategy. And so this last go around, I saw something that I thought was very interesting. And of course you click on it and, and then that started the process. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to see how it goes. Now, when when you think about attracting the right people, and 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 I'm assuming I'm in there, so I must be sort of the right person. But how do you determine what is the right kind of not necessarily criteria for you? Let's go. Let me ask the question differently. What makes a good board member? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, there, there's obviously different boards. Uh, will will tell you different things that they're looking for. But what makes a good board member, um, I mean, one of the big things that 
I personally look for in people is uh, the old word of grit, you know, somebody that just knows how to get in there and get it done. Um, the style that you're looking at, you know, I mean, I'm a CEO, I run a company, I'm taking care of the daily things. Uh, I'm on a couple boards myself as well. And I treat those positions totally different. So from a perspective of a hands-on person, you know, which I love to just jump in and dig in. And I mean, I sometimes find myself doing things that I shouldn't be. I, you know, I have employees that probably should be doing them, but sometimes I'll just jump in and, and do it myself. I, I don't mind uh, uh, taking care of it. I know it's going to get done right and it's going to get done quicker versus me trying to get somebody else to do it. So um, that from looking at it, what makes a good advisor is I think the, the basics of uh, leadership and taking being a hands off person, but guiding and being able to communicate with the CEO uh, the right way to guide them the right direction. And when it comes to, you know, if you're if you are recruited to um, to help them in networking and utilizing your connections because you're an executive that's been there, done that. Um, you have to be able to obviously uh, understand the vision, the mission, mission of the company. What are they trying to accomplish so that you can go out there when you're connecting them with these networks and you can explain it the right way for the company. So, I mean, com you know, the basics, right? Communication, leadership, uh, being able to guide somebody, being a uh, uh, being being a mentor. Um, I think all of those things fall into, you know, uh, into being a good board member. Some of the other things I think are um, uh, IQ and EQ, uh, which, you know, we IQ is, I, I don't think I need a definition of that. And, and EQ, EQ, you know, is your emotional. Uh, so I, I'm sure you know about all those things, but I think all those things are very important for a advisor to, to be a leader, to be, you know, hands off, but at the same time be there for them. Um, I think the other important thing is time, right? Time has constraints. Um, I, I know quite a few people that are on a few boards and they're still looking for more boards. And I sometimes sit back. I'm like, you know, I don't even know if you have the time. Um, a lot of people think it's easy to just be on a board and jump on a, on a meeting once in a while. Uh, but I think, I think if you don't have, as an advisor, board of advisors, if you don't have 50 hours, to put in, um, then you shouldn't be on a board. Right. Well, that, uh, you you know, that, yeah, I'm sorry, but that's a good point. No, no, that's okay. That's a good point because, so I, I so I sit on a board and we're a very active board. We, we meet quarterly, but you know, we get, we get court, we get monthly financials, you know, when something happens, we're brought in, you know, I, I work with the sales and marketing group to make sure they're on track and things like that. But I've also gone in and, and, as an advisor for other boards. And then when I first meet the board, it's like, well, what were the, what were the assignments in the last board meeting? And it's like, well, there was none. And these people are just <laughs> showing up and, and giving, giving advice based on whatever presentation they hear. So uh, to your yeah. point, it's not, not getting in and doing all of the work, but it's staying involved enough that you understand what is going on to be able to properly give the advice. And as a consultant, I mean, that's part of my job too right now is yep. I might not be doing it. I might be advising, but I can't disappear for 90 days and show up and think I know what's going on. Right. So I think that's a exactly. key, part, key part of, uh, of an advisor or a board of director that, that um, you would have now it in, in looking at, startups versus I'll call it a, maybe a more established, whether it's five years or more. Um, they seem like they might be different people as well, though. hundred percent. Yeah. So, it, and again, it, it not only ranges about time, but where is the company heading? What's, what's their strategy, you know, whether it's a growth strategy or whether they're already at the level of thinking of exit. So for example, one of the companies we put up today, the one that's looking to go IPO, um, if, you know, if I was a CEO and I was looking at taking a company IPO, I would definitely be, you know, for me personally, I, I, that that's out of my game. I've never done that. Never been part of a company that's gone public. Um, I know the general steps behind it, but actually that, you know, to me, that's a scary thing, right? So 
who would I want to bring onto the board? I mean, somebody that's been there and done that, a CFO that's been part of a company that actually took a company public. So yeah, in, in that sense, you're, you know, a company's always looking uh, for somebody particular. Uh, the, the foundation of it is always the same, right? Uh, but when you're going public, it's a totally different game. When you're a startup, you're going to look for somebody that really has the grit, you know, that, that knows how to get in there and get it done, that can really guide you. Uh, I mean, if I was a startup and I was bootstrapping, uh, which I, I guess we did do that, but uh, <laughs> but if we really needed some advice, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to have great partners and we all just fit the right shoes. So we didn't really have to bring anybody in uh, from the get go. Um, but, you know, if you're a startup and you're lacking structure or, you know, really you've hit that point, let's just say you hit that 1 million mark and you have no idea how to go beyond that, then I think finding somebody that's been there, meaning done it, like took a company from from zero or took a company from a million to 100 million, that's the guy you want to work with. Right. You know, it, it, I deal with and I have dealt and still deal with a lot of startups. And there's always that point in time when they understand they need help versus they're convinced that they know it all. They've done it all. They've they've got Thank it. To, you. They've got it to yeah. a point where they just, you know, yeah. I call it, you know, the field of dream syndrome. Build it and they will come. <laughs> and and so it's hard sometimes to get them to understand that they can't do it all. Yeah. And and the, nor should they, you know, as a as a CEO and, and a company. Uh, you were talking about sometimes you jump in and you just do it why right, because you can do it faster and quicker. But for for us, when we we have to be able to to delegate as CEOs, right, and and stay on the focus yeah. and the course. So what is the kind of a the the challenge really for businesses to to recognize that they need some kind of advisor? Are there some kind of trigger points, or is it a frustration? Yeah. yeah. What what where, where in your experience do you see it's time for advisors. So it, it, you brought up a great point, and, and we hear this all the time on the phone. You know, we'll we'll get companies that schedule a call with us <laughs> to go over um, what what we might have been talking about in the email or prior communication with them. And some companies are just wide open to it, and they're like, "Yeah, this is what I need," and they'll give you they'll give us a whole list of the kind of executives that they're looking for. Um, and then sometimes we get on the call um, and, you know, I, I call it an ego, which we both know that's not a good thing. But, yeah, there's a lot of CEOs out there that think they can do it all. So it, it ranges from a CEO that might think that they can do it all. Uh, and sometimes it's as simple as why do I have, you know, they don't have, say, the money to pay an advisor, but they would have to give up equity to bring on an advisor, which I highly recommend if you want to get out of an advisor the most and you can't afford to pay them, but you can also give them equity, you'll, you'll get a lot more out of anybody when they have equity and they have something to basically work towards or grow the mm -hmm. company so they can actually benefit. Uh, feel that ownership. I mean, that's who doesn't like to feel that. So a lot of times when we start digging in, through our interview process. I mean, you went through a uh, onboarding process. Um, we have the same thing for the company side. I mean, okay. the questions are slightly different, but very mimicked, but that's how we do the matching. We do an onboarding for executives, we do an onboarding for a company, and then we match up the two when, when everything matches up. So it's funny what happens on an onboarding call with a company because We'll start out and whether it's a guy that tells us he's looking for one executive or whether it's a guy that says, I don't know if I really need it. Why would I have to give up, you know, equity in my company for somebody to come tell me what to do when I know how to do it all myself? When we get in that conversation and start digging in about where they're at, how they got there, what's their goal. Um, and then, you know, the onboarding team member might actually have a perfect match already in their head and they'll throw out a name like what? Well, what would you do if we connected you with, you know, Alfredo or whatever the name may be? Um, all of a sudden, a light bulb comes on. It, it's so funny to hear that. They're like, wait, who? I know that person. They would be great in my company. 
all of a sudden the whole wall drops and they're like, you know what? I, I think I'm, I think I'm a, let's look at what else I could possibly, you know, who else I could possibly use, you know? So it really drops when they realize that I can either build this company to let's just say a million dollars and I'm going to own hundred percent of it. And I'm going to have a lot of stress and these employees and I got to manage it all and, you know, figure everything out. And, but I own hundred percent of it, or I can bring on a team and I, you know, even if you give up 10%, 20% and you got a bunch of advisors that been there, done that, they grow it quicker. They connect you quicker with, with the connections that you've been, you know, dreaming about. Um, and all of a sudden, next thing you do, you wake up and you got a hundred million dollar company. Would, who would not rather have 90% of a hundred million dollar company? I yeah, mean, well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I think once people get past that and understand the benefits of it and why you build a board uh, for growth and strategy and, you know, to, to reach things that you've never reached. And the other great thing, uh, sorry, I'm blubbing. But the other great thing is if you do have a great board and they lead you down the path of huge growth and you let's just say you have a great exit, you sell the company or you have a great merger or you go public, just imagine what happens after that, right? You have this, I mean, let's not even think about the financial aspect of it, but you have this great network, personal network that you've built with your advisors. You have this great success story. And now where do you go from there? It's so much easier to start a new company or, or become an advisor and go help out other companies. It just, that, that's the part I think that once people see a CEO sees and understands the the possibilities, it, the possibilities are endless once you do that. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, obviously a lot of it's about money, but it <laughs> as 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 my dad used to say to me, hey, money won't make you happy. I said, yeah, dad, but it'll make me smile a lot. But <laughs> it, it's about it, but it's about purpose too, right? I mean, money, in my opinion, the money gives you freedom to do things that you really want to do and invest and not worry about it. And, and you know, I, I talk to people when they say they sold their company, they retire and, you know, six months later, they're bored out of their mind and they're doing something different. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that that just never end because I really enjoy one of my guests in the last show. I just said if I could, I'd work seven days a week, 24 hours a day because I, I actually enjoy it versus yeah. it's not a frustration to me now. One of the things that do you have a, a a success story and a story you can share about a match that you made? You swipe left. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I love that. <laughs> the easiest one that I can do that's uh, or that I can say, I mean, there, there's there's definitely a few of them out there, but the easiest one that actually can be confirmed is we worked with a uh, public company. Uh, it's publicly traded, I believe, on the Australian market. I don't, I don't, it's not on Nasdaq. But either way, it is a public company um, and uh, we worked with them and they were looking for a new CMO uh, type of uh, person for their board. And, uh, and that process actually was a really long process. This was our first public company, I think, that we worked with. Might have been the second one, um, but it, it took a while. Uh, I can't even tell you how many resumes they went through, uh, how many interviews they went through, uh, multiple interviews per each executive. Um, and they finally nailed it down and they finally uh, recruited one of our board members. And the story came out, of course, a public company has to make a PR announcement when they recruit a, uh, a new board member. Uh, in this case, they recruited two of them. Uh, the other one did not come from us. One did come from us. Um, either way, the story came out. Uh, the only thing that really made me mad about the story is it did not mention us. I wish they would have name dropped boards. Yeah, either. Of course, of course. Um, but uh, uh, their stock shut up the very the very first day that they announced, you know, that they brought on this executive, and uh, she was she was uh, a great executive, a really good CMO. Oh, fantastic. So. Um, I understand you're writing a book. I, I am. Yes. I'm in the process okay. of writing a book. Hopefully it'll be out in April. I'm okay. falling a little and, bit behind. And I, I'm, I'm going to assume that the premise is about establishing boards. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes, uh, the book will start out a little bit about 
me and kind of the same question you asked, except a lot, the book will have, be a little bit more involved of my drive behind this and why I'm doing it just so that there's an understanding. Um, and then, yeah, there's a, uh, it talks, you know, talks about why companies need boards, uh, why executives should join a board. Um, yeah, pretty much talks about that stuff. Okay. Do you find that, uh, and I don't know, in general, maybe because of the pandemic and COVID and people working at home, have you seen an increase in, in people, even like myself, deciding that they want to get more involved in boards? Because, you know, frank, but I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been working at home. Uh, doing a, a kind of a home gig since 2014 when I left the corporate world. So COVID was, yeah. So what's the difference? I'm doing this anyway. I, you know, I just don't go out as much, but, but <laughs> so for me, it's not any more time, but it's a genuine interest of mine. Cause I, I love being on the board that I'm on. I love the nonprofits that I've worked with. And so I, I personally, as part of my kind of growing growth strategy of, I wanted to sit on a, is either an advisor or a board member on one or yeah. two others. So it's a personal thing, but do you see an increase of people looking? Um, I, I think I see an increase in actually uh, both sides. And so obviously when the COVID hit, we, uh, we didn't come to a halt, but we definitely had a hiccup. And of course, you know, uh, our board or me and my partners had a little freak out moment. Um, but it wasn't anything focused on our company. I mean, this was a worldwide epidemic uh, and worldwide problem. And uh, when it comes to companies, it was a company-wide pro problem where, you know, whether you're a public company or a small company, you were definitely concerned. Um, so we had about a uh, month and a half, maybe two month kind of a slowdown. We weren't sure if this was going to stay like that or wow, are we, you know, is this it? And uh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, everybody, it seemed like it took about two months for everybody to get used to working remotely, mm -hmm. figure out that they can have remote meetings. I mean, I, I have a really a C-suite executive friend that's at a uh, large company at Micron. And I mean, I can't even tell you, you know, how much flying time he spends, you know, flying all over the world meeting with, with uh, different companies. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, his, his traveling literally came to a halt. And I used to tease him all the time. I'm like, why can't you guys just do a web conference? You know, and he would always say, well, you know, I like to travel, but at the same time, you know, the person to person, the handshake really changes things. And I was like, yeah, no, I totally get it. I'm just trying to figure out why you do it so much. Um, and all of a sudden, yeah, he, he, you know, his traveling is, is for a while. I mean, he's out of back of the office now, but for a while it was sitting just like me and you in the house and all his meetings went uh, to a web. So once the companies figured out how to continue, which we all knew they would eventually, um, it actually increased on both sides for us. One, it increased obviously on the executive side. Um, but the, the best part, I think, out of it that we got is it really increased on the company side. So we used to get on these calls all the time and we would bring on a company that's based out of New York. <clears throat> and one of the questions in the onboarding uh, questionnaire is, are you looking for a board member that's local to you, um, somebody on the East Coast, or are you open to anybody worldwide for remote work? And most of the time it was local or, or somebody nearby. We want them available. We want them to be their hands on if needed. We want to have a face to face meeting with them. That completely went away. That's gone. So what what now what they usually say is, no, I don't care where they are. I just want the best. Yeah. All right. Very cool. What uh, what inspires you? What gets you out of bed every morning? Uh, my wife kicks me out of bed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. She's still sleeping when I get up. Um, you know, I uh, one thing that I don't know how many years it's been now, but it's been so many years, it's programmatic for me. My wife doesn't understand how I do it, uh, but I wake up anywhere between. I don't have an alarm set. I don't work off of an alarm. I wake up Monday through Friday. I wake up anywhere between 5, 5.30 a.m., and I sneak out of bed. Um, 
and I get dressed and I leave for the gym. Um, and if I don't, yeah. And if I don't do that, I, I am a disaster rest of the day. Like I, I can't seem to function. So I need to go to the gym. I do my little warm up. I do my, my, my workout. And I just feel like a new person when the blood starts circulating and then I can really focus that the body just supports the mind. That That's my personal opinion. And I, again, I've been doing this for a long time and it's just automatic. And the funny thing is on, uh, on weekends, I have no problem. I'll, again, no alarm set, but I'll, I'll sleep into 6.30 or 7. And that's, it's funny for me to say that sleep into 6.30 in the morning. Um, but you know, for me that is sleeping in, but yeah, I'll sleep in a little bit longer and, and, um, and then usually I either go on a bike ride or on Sundays, I usually play soccer, but that's later in the day. So, well, I think it's, it's a, it's an, a testament to, you know, we talk about this all the time, this work-life balance and, you know, what does that really mean is for the individual, but it, it there, there has to be give and take, uh, um, when, when, you know, COVID hit, we ended up getting a Peloton and so, Us too. <laughs> yeah, so we, we ride our Pelotons and, and then we use the app on the TV to get some exercise in. We're, we're big hikers, so that's outdoors, so we can still do that uh, and do some biking and things like that. But uh, just finding that time and, and I'm like you, I wake up. Unfortunately, I still wake up on Saturday and Sunday at the exact same time, <laughs> but I try to get down there and work out before the day starts. Um, because a lot of times once it starts, it just becomes impossible. And, and so yeah. that, uh, makes it more difficult. Yeah. So, even, uh, I, I, I've had a few days where I didn't make it in the morning, you know, within the last 20 years. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I'll go in later in the day and it just it, doesn't happen. Yeah. It doesn't happen at all. Uh, I do that all the time. That's usually my stall tech. I'll, I'll do it later. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation. I mean, it's, it, it, and for me, especially because I have just become one of your subscribers. Yeah. And uh, so it's interesting to hear. It, it confirms a lot of my perceptions. I think for anybody here listening on the podcast today, I mean, it's a it, it's a great organization. If you're thinking about that, you want to sit on a board or become an advisor. I mean, it's a great place to go to, to start or and or and or join. Um, I think that, uh, you know, proof's in the pudding and, and we'll see yeah. that, you know, just <laughs> Just uh, in the uh, 20 minutes I spent when I got my link today, knowing that we were going to talk. I mean, I I think I probably scanned 20 or 30 uh, organizations and just trying to figure out. But I did click on a few and I thought that made sense for me. And, and I clicked awesome. the button. We'll see where that goes. Um, so kind of the uh, kind of parting question then becomes, is there is there one or two tips or suggestions to to the listeners that if they are thinking about becoming a board member or a board advisor, what are what are what are some tips that you can give them to for either for their consideration or kind of maybe what their criteria or their background should be? Um, so you know, again, you don't want you know I don't want one of my sons who's in his late twenties trying to become <laughs> a board advisor, right? So no. you know, this is this, somebody that's got some experience, but again, you're bringing a, a value to the organization, whether it's cash or stock or a combination thereof. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the big thing to keep in mind is if you're a C-suite executive with a success history, uh, you know, and that can be anywhere from one success story. Um, it can be anybody that's been in a startup and had a great exit and now can give back. Um, or if you've been in the corporate world for a long time, um, especially if it's been in a w- one one industry, um, there's companies in every industry coming to us and, uh, you know, whether it's getting help from an entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur, or, or whether it's getting help from a corporate person that's had years, you know, say 20 years in uh, one specific industry that this company is seeking help in. I mean, y- you can give back, you know, if you have the time, uh, <laughs> if you're bored and you're retired, uh, you, you can give back. So. Um, you know, you asked me the question of what gets me up and I teased you, teased about going to gym. Uh, the other thing that gets me up when it comes to work is success stories. I mean, I, you know, I, I wish we had a lot more of them. I wish it happened 20 times per day, but you know, these connections are not the easiest to make, you know, since we're dependent on third party, uh, both 
the executive and the company have to come to an agreement. Um, but when they do happen, I tell you that that's something to wake up to and, and look forward to. So, um, uh, it, it's exciting. Um, I, I think the other thing that executives might look into is education, certification, uh, stay sharp and have your board documents updated. Uh, that, that is a key. And that's two other things that we're working on for the new platform I mentioned. One is there will be a kind of an interview uh, wizard template that you go through that will help you structure your board documents. Um, and then uh, the other one is is a is down the line, but we're hoping by the end of the year, uh, if we can if we can do it sooner, we will. Um, it's a huge investment on our part, but we are looking at putting together education and certification, um, which will actually be uh, grandfathered into you know for all of our members. Uh, and it's not like there's going to be a some price or some catch to it, but. We want uh, we want all the executives to help out the best that they can, uh, and we think that having some governance education is never a, a, a bad thing. So, yeah, no, I, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, because it, it, it just because you are you know a marketing guy doesn't mean you necessarily can translate that over if you've never really given advice or been that kind of supervisor in the sense. To your point, if you're doing it, then you're no longer an advisor. Yeah. And and I know for me and, and a lot of my engagements, part of it that's that's written for me is you need to educate my people, teach them how to do it, give them advice. If I don't need you to do it. If I do, then I'm just going to hire you or somebody like you, right? because <laughs> ultimately, exactly. you know, I, I'm not looking for a full time job. You know, I'm a fractional person. So, yeah. Um, so I look at, you know, with the board and getting involved and like saying, not that I'm doing things, but I, if I need things or want to see things moving, then I, you know, give that advice and show people how to do it and, and walk them through it. And, and, and that's again, part of my job. And that's why I think it's I, I translating over to the boards I do work on and hopefully some future ones as well. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. Well, Martin, this has been, uh, been very interesting. Um, I, uh, like I said, from a practical application standpoint, I'm looking to see, uh, see how it goes forward, but, uh, it, it's very interesting. And for you listeners out there, if this is something that you're interested in, check it out. And it's B-O-A-R-D-S-I, Ford Z, Ford's I. Yep. How, how, do you want, how do you want me to say it? Got it? You know what? It's like you say tomato, I say tomato. Okay. Yeah. So either yeah. one works. <laughs> you call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. So, exactly. uh, <laughs> well, Martin, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate your time and I'm glad we had a chance to chat. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Martin, I want to thank you again for joining me here on the cafe and thank you to my listeners for showing up today. If your business needs a CMO or a senior level marketer and you're not quite ready for a full-time person yet, please connect with me. I'd love to talk to you about my fractional interim or consulting marketing services, or certainly visit me at theponzigroup.com. I have a variety of resources there, videos, blogs, eBooks, things that you can download and certainly connect with me on LinkedIn. Lastly, please subscribe to the show. And if you're already a subscriber, I encourage you to let others know about the show so they can benefit from the great content like you heard today and on the other shows. You can subscribe at thebusinessgrowthcafe.com or on any podcast platform you like to listen to. Again, thank you. And don't forget to join me here next week at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.